Ezekiel chapter 1, please. Ezekiel chapter 1, the glory of God and how it applies to us as believers and what it really means. If you want to define the word glory this morning, it means God's holiness, God's exalted magnificence, or God's divine perfection. Ezekiel chapter 1, I haven't read it yet. Ezekiel chapter 1, um, we're going to be in the latter portion of it. Um, Ezekiel chapter 1, we're not going to read the entire chapter here, but simply put, God uh, appears here to uh, Ezekiel, and he sees these creatures, he sees what is under the place where God sits, and he starts to talk about these animals with wings and there's wheels, and, and if you've ever read Ezekiel, it's, you, you, you try to get this in your mind, and you say, man, I can't picture it. I got an idea. I mean, there's these creatures, and they're running like this, but they never turn, and there's a wheels, and one wheel amongst the wheels. I, I mean, you can't really grasp it until, unless we were there. Um, it must have been an amazing thing. And as if the creatures weren't as exciting enough in this scripture, then we get down to Ezekiel 1 in uh, verse uh, 24. We're going to find out here um, this place where God is sitting, where God is reigning. Just go to verse uh, 20. Whithersoever the Spirit was to go, they went. Talking about the creatures. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. When those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. You guys understand this, right? <laughs> no, I don't either. I can only imagine what he's seeing here. Think of a gyroscope. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine a bunch. Yeah, yeah, there's things going on here. And the likeness of the firmament, which is the space upon the heads of the living creature, was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. So it's this great light of crystal, if you would. And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Everyone had two which covered on this side. Everyone had two which covered on that side their bodies. Two wings. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of the speech, as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. And there was a voice from the firmament was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. Now, listen, the voice was over. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. Of course, we know all these creatures and all this stuff that's underneath of where God dwells and where he sits on his throne. All this is below him, beneath him. But above him, it says, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, sapphire stone upon the likeness of the throne was a likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud of the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. So God only knows what this glory must have been looking like and what an experience this was for Ezekiel. But again, if we would look at a definition of God's glory... It is an idea of his holiness, his exalted magnificence, and his divine perfection. I want to talk to you about four points this morning about God's glory and where it is seen. God's glory and where it is seen. First of all, we see here it's where God is sitting, as where God is sitting, um, or where God's throne is. And we see that here in Ezekiel chapter 1. Um. We find in the Bible, look at Isaiah chapter 48. I want to go into something very quickly here. Isaiah chapter 48. Man really likes to have honor and glory in this world, doesn't he? We like, um, in our natural sense, to be honored. We like to be something special. Um, now I don't know what Trump is now, but I know before... It was said that when he used to sit in his Trump Towers, that in his office, was he surrounded himself with pictures of himself. 
So he was really impressed with who he was, obviously. Um, and man really left to himself will seek to only bring glory to one person, and that is themselves. We've, we've heard the expression, you know, me, myself, and I, and, you know, me, a mano, and, and that's who you got to worry about. Um, Isaiah 48, verse 11 here, very clearly, though, and we need to be careful here as well, even as believers, that we do not steal God's glory. There's probably nothing more heartbreaking than seeing God do something and we should not, we don't give him the glory that he deserves. The Bible tells us there, there was a time when Herod came out before the, the people and they all said, he is a God. He is a God because that's what, you know, pagans believe. They believe their kings are gods. They're equal with the gods in heaven. And of course, the Bible says, because he refused to give glory and honor to God. He was eaten up with worms almost immediately. God killed him. God killed him. Now, of course, we know there's a lot of blasphemers today that still and have been down through the generations. But you know, at the end of the day, when man's laid, laid into the grave, you know what we know? We're not really much, are we? When we're lying on our deathbed, when we're breathing our last breath, there's one thing we know. We're not God. We're not even close to being what God is. And... Um, and yet we really think in our own hearts, men really get excited about themselves and they get excited about one another. And according to the Bible here, Isaiah 40, 48, 11, he says, for mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it? For how should my name be polluted? Now listen to this. And I will not give my glory unto another. It's not saying here that God can't get glory in people's lives. It's the idea that God says, I'm the one that sits on the throne. I'm the creator. I am Almighty God. And of course, in uh, many times in the book of Isaiah here, Brother Joe, he was talking about preaching a message here. Actually, on this very verse, he said, I am the Lord God, and beside me there is no other. And yet man really thinks himself to be something, don't they? They seem to have their own exalted magnific magnificence and their own divine perfection. And they think themselves to be all and great, and yet in the truth of it, in the end, we're really nothing. Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. Look at this. Proverbs 25. Here's what God says about us. And when we think we are something, as the Bible says, when we're really nothing. And even as Christians, one of the, the things that we can be uh, led captive by the devil through is not just the lust of the flesh, not just the lust of the eyes, but what's the third one? The pride of life. All that's in the world, the Bible says, is not of the Father. And then the Bible describes the three things that can destroy a Christian's life and even anybody in this world, the lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the third one is the pride of life. And um, often as Christians begin to get things right with the Lord, then the old pride of life kicks in and Christians start thinking, well, you know what? I'm better than brother so-and-so. Well, they're not as close to God as I am. That's, that's, that's one of the devil's tools, man, that he uses to destroy Christians individually and he uses to destroy churches collectively. He gets pride working in somebody's life and the rest is history, man. If pride took a third of the angels out of heaven to follow Lucifer... We're talking about millions here, friend. Then it can certainly do a work in the heart of man to destroy the work of God as well. And so um, just keep that in mind here today. God help us to be humble um, as we walk in this world and not to be seeking our own glory, but God's glory in our life. Amen. So let's, let's look at some of this. It says in Proverbs 25, verse 27, read that. It is not good to eat much honey. Yes, sir. 25, chapter 25, verse 27. It is not good to eat much honey. So for men to search their own glory is not glory. That's what God says. You try to live your life for yourself, make yourself look good, everybody be impressed with you, forget it. It's not going to go very well for you. In fact, in the end, even, listen to me, God said, every man at his best state is still altogether vanity. In the end, we should be seeking God's glory. Would you go to John 7, 18 here for a minute? I like what Jesus said here as he was being attacked by the Pharisees continually. And of course, 
John chapter 7, verse 18. In this scripture, we find, of course, the Pharisees were always, and Sadducees were always challenging Jesus. And what a group of wanting to be seen of men we have when we came to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. How many times Jesus warned and said, don't, how many times he says, for one scripture comes to my mind, he said, they do these things to be seen of men. They wanted to be glorified. They wanted to be uh, well spoken of. They wanted to be admired. Um, you know what the Bible says, woe unto us when all men speak well of us. It, we're, we've got the wrong focus when we're trying to be glorified as in man's eyes instead of God's eyes. And I like the fact that when Jesus Christ, think about this for a minute, went to the cross of Calvary, he was despised and rejected of men, the Bible says. Despised and rejected of men. He wasn't worried about glory. He was more worried about obedience to God. And all forsook Him. All fled from Him. Everyone was against Him. And yet you will not find in the Bible any man who got more glory and honor than the Lord Jesus Christ. And He is our example. He is our example. And look at these words that he said when he was walking here on the earth, John 7, verse 18. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. Now just stop right there for a minute. I do not listen to Rush Limbaugh. I'll never listen to Rush Limbaugh. Do you know why? Because Rush Limbaugh loves someone else more than God, and it is Rush Limbaugh. He calls himself equal with God. He uses the Hebrew word. I forget what it is here off the top of my head. It might come to me in a little bit. And he calls himself the great El Rushball. El in the Hebrew means God. He calls himself that. He's a blasphemer of God. How many Christians, listen, I, I just can't stand him. I, I think this man hates God and he loves himself more than anyone else. And yet I hear Christians listen to him all day long. I don't know how you can stand him. I can't, I can't take it. Well, that's your business. Maybe you got more thick skin than me. You know, you different personalities can listen to different people, but I can't, I can't handle him. And it's always about him and how great he is. You know something, in the end, Rush Limbaugh will die and go to hell. Because he didn't love the one he should have loved. And he was not des desiring God's glory in his life. He's lived his life for himself. To be seen. To be the greatest. And in the end, all is vanity in his life. He'll realize in the end who he should have lived for. Who his life should have been about. Amen? And I just want to say this for a minute. If you come in contact with a lover of God, they will speak of God. Read the rest of the story here, or the verse, verse 18. He that speaketh of himself seeketh, not, seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. God is telling to us this is how we can discern as believers who really loves God and who is a lover of themselves. The Bible says that if a lover of God, if someone is a lover of God, they will speak of God. I'm not going to go to a church. I'm not going to be part of being around people that are always speaking of themselves. I want to know someone and I want to be with someone who not only loves God, but is speaking of God. You know how you can find out if somebody's a lover of God's Word? They will speak about God's Word. You know how if somebody is a lover of the brethren? They will speak well of the brethren. See, God said out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. And when you start to hear somebody over and over and over again speaking of themselves, you know you're dealing with someone. Or you start talking about, and here's how, let me just give you this. I've seen it a thousand times in false prophets. Here's what it always is. I'm the one that has the message from God. I have the prophecy. I can show you something. God's revealed something to me. It's, and it comes down to that the whole way through false doctrine. It's always me, me, me. Glory, glory, glory. Right here. Here it is. That's not, God's, that's not God's man. That's not God's work. When God works in someone, He honors Himself. And yes, there's honor seen in that person's life, but you can tell that God is working. You don't see man, you see God. And when a man is filled with God or a life of a believer, 
again, the mouth will speak and reveal. And just, just put that in your little lunchbox, if you would, of discernment and pull that out when you're listening to someone or when you're around someone and say, you know, seems like this isn't about God. Seems like this is about something else. You might be sitting around someone who is not a lover of God, not a lover of God's word. And of course, when they begin to speak evil, the brethren, then you know, of course, that they don't have those first two areas right in their life either, do they? A little bit of wisdom there. Secondly, here, where not only God is, is uh, sitting, but where God is reigning. We find in heaven God reigns there, and His glory is seen, isn't it? In the Bible, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, there's great glory and honor. They, they say, worthy is Him, worthy is Him, great glory and honor. We also find where God is working, there is glory seen. Go here very quickly in Psalm 19.1. I want to tie some things together here. Psalm 19.1, where God is working, we see glory. His glory. Two things here we're going to put together. And this is a pretty basic principle, and yet it's very profound to think about. Why does God get glory in His creation? Because according to Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and you've seen that, haven't you? Did you look at the sunset? as you look at outer space. And guess what? The third heaven is also declaring the glory of God. Um, Talked about that Wednesday night with the young people here. It's a really good Bible study we did. And the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So God says here the heavens declare the glory of God. Why is it? that we can see not only in outer space, but even in this world that God has created. Because in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. How is it that God's glory can be seen in what He's done? Not only because He created it, but listen to me for a minute, but because it's doing exactly what God told it to do. The earth is still obeying God. You say, well, I don't believe that. You're putting life to the earth. Now, Mother Nature lovers, they get a little bit caught up on this, and they start calling the Mother Earth. Well, the truth of the matter is, if you study your Bible, God refers to the earth as being a she. Did you know that? Very interesting. Um, Refers to it as a feminine, earth. It actually uses those words. But, of course, we know the earth is not sustaining of itself. It's in obedience to God. The sea, underground rivers, up comes the springs. It's going to continue until... God says, stop. The atmosphere and the oxygen and the carbon dioxide, that that process is going to continue. The rain and the evaporation that goes back up in that water cycle, you know what? That's going to continue until God says otherwise. That atmosphere, all these ozone people says we're destroying everything. Guess what? That ozone is not going anywhere until God says it's done. It's not going to go away because God put it there to protect us and give us a place to inhabit. The stars in the sky that we see will not go away because God put them there and they're obeying God's Word. Now, let's make a little bit of application here. Those things bring glory and honor to God because they obey Him and they do exactly what God has commanded them to do. Same thing in the life of the created being of Christ. Those of us who are born again are able to honor God when God is seen in our life. And, you know, the world is looking for a God that is living and a God that is breathing. We need Him to be working in our life. Ephesians chapter 10, go with me there for a minute. You're going to see something neat here. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. The Bible says the whole earth in Isaiah 6, 3 is full of God's glory. So His glory is seen in the heavens. His glory is seen in the earth. The creation of God. Born again Christian, can I say something to you this morning? You are the creation of God. God made you what you are today by His grace, by His blood. You know why God did it? I mean, you ever wondered? Well, because He didn't want me to go to hell. Absolutely. I believe that. But the Bible says God would get glory in the church. That's why we're here today. That's why He created this institution. It was for His glory and honor. But do you know why He saved you? Ephesians 2.10 gives us the answer. Let's read that together. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Again, as we said the other week, God has created us with a purpose. And we've been born again. 
And it says here in Ephesians chapter 10, uh, 2, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Who gets the glory when it comes to salvation? Not us. Listen again. It fits with what we've already said this morning. Someone begins to talk about what they've done to become a Christian. Uh Uh-uh. God will not give His what? Glory unto another. Remember that. God is the one who saves man. But look what it says in our life after we're saved. It's not just the glory of God in salvation, but it's also God's glory in what is coming as a result of that salvation. It wasn't, that was not just the end game. I don't want people to die and go to hell. God had more of a, of a purpose than that. He could have done that. You know, he could have just said, you got saved, Trish. Come on up to heaven. You're done. Miss Helen, 40 years ago, I, forgive me, I don't know how long ago you got saved. That's it. Come on up. But God left you here. God has a purpose for you here. Look what it says. For we are His workmanship. Amen. Look at this word. Created. Amen. God gets glory and honor by those things that command, uh, obey His commandments and do exactly. Remember, the world is upheld by the authority of His Word with all great power. That's why everything is still what it is today. Our lives would be the same way. Not of work, or Verse 10, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God wants to get glory in our life. We have to obey. We have to follow God's commands. We have to do what He told us to do. And that's why I believe the Bible says, whatsoever you do, do so as unto the Lord, and do it all for the glory of God. That's what the Bible says. Look at Philippians chapter 1. I found a verse here as I was studying. Really neat verse. God wants to work in our life, not just when we got saved, but oh my, how much greater after that day that we got saved. And I hope that you can say today, I want God to work in my life. I want God to make me what He wants me to be. I want to fulfill His righteousness in my life. According to Philippians chapter 1, look what Paul prayed here for these believers. Being filled, verse 11, with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Pastor, how am I going to bring God glory in my life? Allow Jesus Christ to work in your heart and life and bring forth fruit. That's how glory comes. That's how glory is seen. Not much of an orange tree without oranges. Not much of a Christian life without seeing Christ in our life. Help, may God help us to be seen in our lives. Fruits of righteousness which are by Christ Jesus unto His glory and praise. We also see not only God is seen where He is sitting and where He is reigning, not only where God is working as He should be in our life, but also where God is walking. Two more here very quickly. We'll be in the book of Exodus and we'll close. Exodus 16.10, where God is walking. Oh, that uh, we would say today, Lord, would you walk with us? Would you go with us as we go with thee? That's what we need in our lives. That's what we need in this church. That's what we need in our hearts and our homes. We need God to walk in the midst of us. Again, as I was reading this week, I forget at some point I was reading, studying, maybe it was Wednesday, and um, how the author of that book was emphasizing the fact that unless the Spirit of God, unless God is working, there's nothing that can happen. There's nothing that can happen. If you, if you study the his, historical aspects of Israel, None of that happened without God. All the things that happened to Israel were because God was with His people. We should expect and pray for the same in our life, that God would bring glory in our life because He is walking with us. Exodus 16.10. Remember, there was a pillar of fire by night. You remember that? 
that they followed when they came out of Egypt, and there was a cloud by day. And the Bible says in Exodus 16, 10, And it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. How are we going to have God's glory in our life if He's walking, not only with us, but can I say this, walking in us? The Bible talks about that. As a nation of Israel, God said, I will walk in my people. We need that work in our hearts, in our lives. Lastly, we find also the glory of God is seen where He is speaking. Exodus 24, verse 16. Exodus 24, verse 16. There's one thing that cannot be faked to a discerning believer. You know what that is? That's the glory of God. You know when you're in a Holy Ghost meeting. You know when you are hearing from someone who's been in the presence of God. It can't be faked. When I was young, I remember preaching and I'm thinking, you know, I just need to be loud and I need to be, I need to be excited and I need to stomp and I need to spit and I need to... You can't fake it. You can't fake it. You could hear some of the best orators on the face of the earth and you could tell if God is with them. And you can hear some of the most stammering, stuttering, lisping, bumbling speakers on earth and you know when God is speaking through them. You can see it. You can't fake fake unction. You can't fake utterance. It's from God. Yes, absolutely. Exodus chapter 24. Look at this. Between Exodus chapter 24, we find here God speaking. And of course, you know what happens here. This is the uh, nation here going up. They're coming up to the Mount, Mount Sinai. And we find here that God said He wanted His people to come up and He took some of the elders and He took some of the men, the leaders up there. Verse uh, 9 Exodus 24, 9, then went up Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet a paved work, a sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness, much like what Ezekiel saw. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Watch this. Also they saw God and did eat and drink. But watch verse 12. The Lord said unto Moses, come up to me into the mount and be there. And I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua and Moses went up into the mount of God. We can see God afar off, but Christian, may it be said of us, we want to see God's glory in our life. We need to get near to Him. We need to be close to Him. We need to set our faces towards Him where God is speaking. Those who've read God's Word and are faithful to seek it, you will see a difference in their life. You will see God's glory seen in their life. We find ten chapters later, after Moses there goes before God, and all of this was put forth that God would have him to do, including the Ten Commandments. He comes down from the mount. Go to Exodus 34. He comes down from the mount. In verse 28, there's a summary of those 40 days that he's there, those 10 chapters. And in Exodus 34, verse 28, he said, And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights, neither did eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the table the words of the covenant and the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand when he came down from the mount, watch, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. You know what Moses was doing? Just exactly what God told him to do. Come on up here, seek my face. I'm going to talk to you for a while. I'm going to give you some things. Christians, you know what happens? God will get glory in our life if we're not concerned about getting glory but we're just seeking His face. That's all that matters to us. God, where are you today? I want to seek your face. I want to be with you. I want to look to you today. And here's what's interesting. Moses was so fixed on God and so 
towards him, that he came down from the mount, and everybody went, whoa, whoa. And the Bible says that glory was so strong seen on his face that he had to put a veil on his face because the people were overwhelmed with the glory of God that was seen on him. It, it almost scared them. He was 40 days in God's presence. Well, that tells me the more time we're in the presence of God, the more glory is going to be seen in our life. God help us, amen, to be in every service that we can, to have every devotion time that we need, to pray earnestly, to keep our faces towards God. And again, how is God's glory seen in our life? Where God is working, where God is reigning, we see His glory. Where God is working, we see His glory in our life. Where God is walking, we see His glory. And that, thank the Lord, has been seen in this church. This year, we've seen people saved. We're thankful for that. And of course, lastly, where God is speaking, we see His glory. And we should be setting our faces upon Him. All right, let's pray here and pray and hope that uh, something here has been a help to you this morning. That uh, we would be like Moses and seek God's glory, seek His face evermore, the Bible says. And God will take care of the rest. He'll get glory and honor in our life. We need to be that way with this church. We need to be that way in every area of our life. Father, thank you this morning for this message. Thank you for the words we've read. Thank you for our study in God's Word. And uh, Father, I pray that each day we would have our hearts towards you. And thank you for the privilege we have to come to you, Lord, and that we can acknowledge you in all of our ways. Our hearts are deceitful, Lord. Our natural desire is to not in the flesh seek you. But God, I pray that we would, every day of our lives, um, Lord, be setting our faces again towards you, that the glory of God might be seen. Help us, Lord, like to think uh, like your glory is seen in the creation around us, might we say, Lord, we want your life and glory to be seen in our lives as we obey you and keep your commandments. Lord, I pray today that something will be hid in our hearts, that the devil will not steal this word from us, uh, but God, it would make a change and would help us to live for you all of our days, God, and the greater glory can be seen. The Bible goes on to say we're changed from glory to glory. And the path of the just is as, shineth, is as a shining light that shines more and more until the day of perfection. God, one day we are going to see Thee face to face. And we look forward to that moment when all glory and honor will be given to You. And uh, God, we're just looking forward to that day. Be with us here today as we continue in the services. Might You be with those that can't make it. And uh, God, just strengthen us, help us, and Lord, we'll give you the glory and honor, for you're worthy of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.